This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability and a generous investment by Julianne Wrigley. Let me start with, this, with the notion of science for a minute. We were talking about this earlier. What is science? Science is a process, a discipline. The more data, more science, the more information, the more we know, we build on what we've learned, the more we understand. I looked it up in the dictionary just to be sure. And one definition is knowledge as of facts or principles knowledge gained by systematic study. I don't think we could think for a moment that anything that happens in Washington or really anywhere else these days is very systematic, unless it's uh, just sort of a systematic waste of time. We collect data in science. We construct models. Information leads to understanding. We build on all of that to create knowledge, which is why we work in universities and why universities are so exciting to be in. Here's the problem, though. That's not how people work, most people. It's certainly not how politics work, and it's not how the media work. So I want to talk today a little bit about what that means, what the challenges are that that presents, what we can do about it, what the opportunities are, maybe some of the obligations that universities have, maybe new obligations that universities have, uh, to enter the fray and how we can make it all compelling, engaging, meaningful, smart, maybe a little clever, maybe, God forbid, cool. Now, as was mentioned, I started this project, Planet Forward, which has been a lot of fun, and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, and I'll show you a clip. You can avert your eyes because there's this really ugly guy doing the thing, so. Um, and I've really enjoyed that, fundamentally because I believe in the power of storytelling. But I also believe and it's why I based it at George Washington University and the power of the university and all that it represents to pull people together, like in this room. Young people who are students, accomplished people who are scientists, people who are staff, who are working every day, people in the community who come because you're interested. This place has a special credibility. It has a special draw. It can reach beyond the classroom. It can have an impact that goes beyond however brilliant your professor is what she tells you at the front of the class. You bring those things together and it's incredible what we can do and boy do we need it because as I say Washington's broken, the media are a mess and the public is confused and angry and frustrated and scared. And this issue, this climate issue, this thing is so important and from a pol uh, public policy uh, point of view virtually stagnant that we're sort of in condition red here a little bit I think. So here's the question, though. In the end, will the public rally to it? What's going on? Well, uh, not too long ago, a new poll uh, reported on NPR caught my ear. Caught my ear, on, not my eye, NPR. Um, suggesting that we're going backwards in this whole thing. 18%, almost one in five, say they don't think global warming is happening at all. Fewer than half believe that if it is happening, that it's caused primarily by human activity. This is the one I like, Dr. Scientist. Only 39% of people in this poll believe, and I'm quoting the poll, most scientists think global warming is happening. That number, by the way, is down from 47% uh, in November of 2008. 40% of people think, I'm quoting again from the poll, 40% think there is a lot of disagreement among scientists about whether or not global warming, warming is happening. So not only do people not know the science, they don't know the scientists who know the science. Maybe that's encouraging. That was a, uh, a Wash Post poll. Now, the, the good news is, especially for those of you who've been watching closely, the presidential election is certain to shed more light on this topic. We can expect deep and thoughtful consideration of the issue. We can assure that the media covering it will peel back the onion and look at who's telling the truth and where that information is coming from. That sound bites won't prevail. I'm not sure about that. Because sound bites will prevail. From Barack Obama saying that all it'll take is green energy 
to deliver jobs and prosperity, which is way oversimplified and is, you know, I was, when I was doing one of my documentaries, I was walking through the National Renewable, I, w I visited the National Renewable Energy Labs in Boulder and I was walking around with this really cool guy who was this, the, the, leads, uh, the lead engineer on the, on the wind turbines and wind power and we were walking past this ginormous turbine and the camera's rolling and I think I have got a, you know, just a dead shot swish from center court question. I said, by the way, where was this made? Thinking he was going to say, you know, Madison, Wisconsin or something. He said, Brazil. I said, Brazil? Why is it made in Brazil? He says, because they make it cheaper down there. But he says, I'm sure that once we get to scale, we'll make them in this country. We all know what China is doing with solar power and what's happening there. He's not alone in the soundbite department. We saw, um, anybody see Governor Rick Perry recently? Um, who accused scientists of manipulating data, and Michelle Bachman, who says that climate change is a hoax. So the idea that our politicians are going to enlighten us in a meaningful and ongoing way uh, is sort of just this side of fiction. It remains a partisan issue. A new Ipsos survey found that 72% of Republicans, as opposed to 92% of Democrats, believe that global warming is happening. And while that still represents three quarters of Republicans and a critical mass that, is, uh, that should be a clear signal to politicians on both sides, there is a very substantial gap and that gap broadens as you drill down into the internals of the polling. One element of which is that the skeptics are becoming more entrenched, it would seem. This, seem. this Ipsos poll said that in, found that in 2010, a year ago, 35% of those who identified themselves as climate skeptics said they were certain of their beliefs. Today that number is 53%. Why so much controversy with this stuff when the science seems so compelling? As I said, because most people are not scientific in the way they absorb their information. They are not scientific in the way they go about their lives. They are not scientific in the way they process information to craft their opinions and beliefs. I have watched this all my career, and it's a fascinating thing. I've taught a class on media bias, which is also a class on personal bias, because very much what you see depends upon where you stand. People's beliefs come, yes, from school and the science courses they took there, but also from friends, community, experience, their trust or lack of it in the institutions that are feeding them their various bits of knowledge or information, from the media, from the belief systems they bring to life, to the table, from their inherent biases, and from their own observations. And that last one, observation, may actually be one reason why that last poll shows some small movement, because people have been observing rougher weather. What do we had? $10 billion or greater uh, weather events and natural disasters just in the last year. And we know what the temperatures have been doing when measured against historical records. So it's maybe nice that people are moving a little bit, but it's a little slow if we're going to expect any meaningful change, and that was certainly reinforced by that experience I mentioned to you yesterday in Washington. There is so little uh, consensus across the aisle in D.C., and there's foot dragging in the high growth developing countries, so just plain little compelling leadership on this issue. Now, I'm not doing this to brown nose because I'm at ASU uh, or because Michael Crow isn't here, but I know he's watching the webcast. But, you're, but Michael Crow, the president of ASU, said the following. What is, it that what, is it, what is it that makes it so difficult to move from what is to what ought to be? I term our present predicament the collapse of the interface. We know more and more, and our knowledge means less and less. He sees a direct challenge to science, and he observes we've not developed an adequate interface between science and society. And that is true. We talked about this earlier. It is a profound challenge to science, and scientists all over the world are running around scratching their heads saying, how do we do this better? How many of you guys have, been, have visited uh, TED, TED.com, TED Talks? Anybody seen Hans Rosling's washing machine presentation? above and below the washing line. There he is on stage with a washing machine. A brilliant illustration that everybody can understand. It's probably not what you'd see in the front of the class. 
and it's probably not what very many media organizations I know would go out of their way to illustrate in order to convey a complex point. So yes, President Crow, <laughs> true enough. Um, media are often the interface. I mean, the beauty of TED is that the interface is a mere click, it's a mere conveyance. There isn't actually an interface beyond the technology it takes you to watch the talk itself. Media, I think, have not developed an adequate interface because we haven't made science real, compelling, approachable. Most journalists don't understand it themselves because mo very few are scientists. In the journalistic organizations, media organizations that had science reporters, many of them have been cut. And so this gets caught up instead, like so much in the, in the journalistic world, in the world of politics and policy, as a war of sound bites, as sort of a crossfire moment, as little one-dimensional bits and pieces. This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability for educational and non-commercial use only.